Um, okay. Almost on time. That's that's really doing really well, considering we're out in the the world. We like saying that. Uh, uh, provost, uh, colleagues, and distinguished guests, and I'd like to especially uh, welcome Susan's family. You are here. You're you're very very welcome. Um, it's my really great honor and pleasure to introduce you to Susan Smith, who was appointed Professor of General Practice in 2022. Today, as we gather for her inaugural lecture at Trinity College, we're not just celebrating her academic achievements, but also, I think, the remarkable person behind these accomplishments. As you can see in the quite extensive biographical notes, um, Susan's appointment at, to a personal chair in public health and primary care is as much a return to base as it is a new beginning, as she is not only a Trinity graduate, but previously worked in the discipline as a senior lecturer with Professor Tom O'Dowd. And Professor Smith's appointment was also the culmination of a varied and distinguished career that took her to South Wales, London, Oxford, Manchester, and Australia before returning to Ireland to complete her MD in UCD and later as an associate professor in RCSI. Susan's research focuses primarily on the primary care of patients with chronic conditions, particularly those with multimorbidity, as we will no doubt hear much more about later. She has been a lead or co-investigator in 10 HRB funded randomized controlled trials based in Irish general practice and is a mainstay of the HRB collaboration in Ireland for clinical effectiveness. The scale and quality of her research outputs are exceptional by any standards, attracting many millions of euros in grant funding, authoring literally hundreds of peer-reviewed publications and supervising dozens of research students. Her leadership roles are too many to list, but include the advisory panel for the Wellcome Trust multi-morbidity PhD program in Scotland and being the associate director of the HRB primary care clinical trials network in Ireland. But what truly sets Professor Smith apart is her ability to merge her clinical experiences with her academic pursuits. In addition to her massive research program, she continues to practice as a GP and to teach a broad range of students. Her colleagues have constantly emphasized the ease with which Susan zooms out to major questions of healthcare delivery and organization, and then zooms in to help individual patients, students, or junior colleagues. As one person said to me, in her new role, Susan is 10 times busier, but not 10 times less available. She is genuinely humble, approachable, and sets the right tone and atmosphere. In a very real sense, Susan manifests her passion for health equity and the need to serve people in our society that often get left behind. She has been successful in applying academic rigor to this messy area of healthcare. And I love the title, Susan. I think it's just perfectly apt, but has avoided the paternalism of the past, insisting on patient and frontline staff empowerment and giving people tools to improve their own health. I think it's particularly fitting that Professor Smith decided to give her inaugural lecture here at the IPH in Tala, as she's firmly embedded in the local primary care ecosystem that she has helped to shape with the other stakeholders. It's really heartening to see what can be achieved with the support of the hospital who partly fund this position, the HSE Community Health Organization, local GPs, community groups, and Trinity College. And for my own part, there was some hesitation in asking Susan to take on yet another role in chairing the Academic Primary Care Collaborative, but she characteristically embraced it without hesitation and has taken it from strength to strength. Susan's colleagues credit her success to her hard work, her demonstrable commitment, her principled approach, and her ability to build trust. Perhaps to her own detriment, Professor Smith is known to be a doer and a finisher. She is notably low-key and grounded, 
and just as likely to turn up on her bike or in her camper van. <laughs> so sometimes apparently she's difficulty getting it out of the car park. <laughs> as one colleague put it, Susan may not be the loudest person in the room, even though she may be the smartest. And if all of those accomplishments aren't enough, Susan has a busy surgeon husband, is mother to three children, and still manages to balance her life, loving the outdoors and nature. So please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Susan Smith to deliver her inaugural lecture, Academic General Practice, Messy But Worth It. Thank you very much. I don't really recognize that introduction, <laughs> but it's very, it's lovely to get it. So um, on, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to just um, come back to Trinity where I, I uh, graduated from, but also to be given an opportunity to do a talk. None of you can ask any questions. <laughs> so I can kind of just give all my opinions and uh, enjoy myself doing that. So unsurprisingly, what I want to focus on is general practice and particularly academic general practice. I'm going to start off by telling you how I became an academic GP, present some of the research that I've done, consider the context in which we do research and conduct teaching, reflect a little bit on our core purpose in universities and medical schools, and then finish with reasons to be cheerful. <laughs> So I, as has been mentioned, I am a graduate of Trinity and I can see Gronia here from my class. <laughs> um, and one of the things that was particularly powerful for us when we were in Trinity Medical School at that time was the course that we did in general practice in public health and primary care that was led by James McCormick and Peter Skrbanek. And it was really, I think most Trinity graduates of that era will really remember that course. They taught us to challenge orthodoxies like screening. You know, no one else was really stopping and saying, you need to think about what you're doing. Could there be harms as well as benefits to any of these things? So that was a very important foundation early on in my career. When I was in final med, uh, myself and David got married. So we embarked on this kind of medical double career odyssey around the world. Um, I wanted to do GP early on. I love the clinical variety. And he was going to do pediatrics followed by pediatric surgery, followed by pediatric plastic surgery, followed by cleft lip and palate. So he had a very long training trajectory <laughs> and I finished relatively quickly compared to him. But we did move from Dublin to Limerick, to Cork, to Cardiff, to London, to Oxford, to Manchester, and then to Australia, and then back to Dublin. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity to work in lots of different health systems as well. But uh, because my training was finished earlier, I also got to do things like I did a master's in health policy and planning in, in Wales, which was really important for me. It introduced me to this thing called the political economy of health, which is that we have, to, we, we have capacity to make decisions about our health systems. And I think doctors often, at, particularly at that time, were not really brought up to think like that, that the choices that we make politically have a, have a real impact. And a little bit before I did that master's, the Black Report had been published. And some of you who are older will remember that report. Um, and it was published by a Conservative government on the August bank holiday weekend with only 260 uh, reports published because <laughs> they were hoping no one would ever read it. Um, and But it, it was really one of the foundation kind of reports on health inequalities, which I'm going to come back to uh, in a bit. So we moved to Australia. And you can see James and Patrick there sitting on a rock. <laughs> they were with us at this point. Um, and I got an opportunity to work in the University of Adelaide uh, as a problem-based learning tutor, which was a brilliant introduction to medical education and really taught me the value of small group teaching uh, and the value of students uh, supporting each other and, and learning together. Around that time, I became very interested in evidence-based medicine, which was just beginning as a kind of a concept being led by Dave Sackett, a Canadian physician who was based in Oxford. And a lot of since then, people often slag off evidence-based medicine. Oh, it's just about randomized control trials, and it's not really, you know, we kind of do it anyway. Or, but in its original conception, to me, it's the essence of what it is to be a good doctor. You need clinical expertise. You need to be able to make a diagnosis. You need to understand and be able to interpret the best available evidence, which often comes from randomized trials or other study designs. Um, and you, but you critically, you need to be able to incorporate patient values and patient expectations into the decision-making process. So 
also when we were in Australia, I was offered an opportunity to participate in the research writing for a diabetes grant. And initially I was kind of thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm really keen on diabetes or not. It's not really, you know, that sexy a subject <laughs> kind of thing. And then I very quickly softened my cough and realized that actually the common things really matter. And if you can do common things well, you will have far bigger impact than maybe some of the more glamorous um, issues in, in research. So we moved back to Ireland and I was extremely lucky to have my MD supervised by Professor Jerry Bury in UCD. Um, and he was a wonderful supervisor and has been always a mentor and supporter. So I did a, uh, there was no system for managing diabetes in Ireland at the time. So my MD was a, a randomized trial of shared care for type two diabetes. And um, what I, I then, I began, and I'm so delighted to see Professor Margaret Couples here, Emeritus Professor in Queens. So at that point, I began a collaboration with Margaret and with Andrew Murphy, who's Professor of General Practice in Galway. And we did probably which is still the largest trial that was ever conducted in Ireland, a North-South trial of a secondary prevention intervention for people with heart disease. We had 940 patients and 45 practices across North and South. And it did show a very small reduction in hospital admissions. <laughs> um, but what I learned from those two original trials was the importance of targeting patients more carefully. And you would think that that would be very obvious, but it's amazing when you look at the literature, how few trials actually target patients who really need interventions. So then I moved to Trinity and I was working with Tom O'Dowd and we, had two PhD students who were working, uh, looking at interventions for people with poorly controlled type two diabetes. What we learned from all of these studies was that we, we, used, we always did qualitative evaluations alongside the trials. And we would have patients, particularly with diabetes, sitting in these focus groups. And we could never, we were trying to get them to talk about our interventions, but they actually only wanted to talk about their diabetes, which was fair enough. Um, so what we decided then, well, is there's something going on here with all these people in the room. So we decided we we got I got a grant. My first big grant was for a trial of peer support in type two diabetes. And the main lesson from that was be very careful. Sometimes things intuitively seem like a great idea and peer support is one of those things. But there's always an unintended consequence. Uh, and one thing we learned was that the people who were trained up as peer supporters would go out on a, a dark evening like this, all ready to go with their groups that they were going to support, and then half of them wouldn't turn up. And in healthcare, we're used to that. It kind of makes our jobs a little bit easier. But if you are a volunteer and you've trained to support other people, that's something that is might have a negative impact on you. And I know, Margaret, you had a similar experience with peer support with young mothers in, in Belfast. So um, around that time, I was working as a GP in Jobstown, and I can see Imelda and many of, of her friends here. I was working in the Mary Mercer Center with Tom, um, and I really remember this patient because she completely changed what happened to my research career after that, and which kind of linked a little bit to the diabetes as well. But she was a 59-year-old woman who had some undiagnosed neurodegenerative condition. They didn't really know what was going on, but she was disabled enough to need a walking frame. She was living on her own. She had pain from arthritis. She had cardiovascular disease and, and heart failure. And she came into me and she said, I've got this pain in my shoulder. I don't know what it is. Can you do something about it? Now at that stage in general practice, we couldn't even get x-rays. So and I remember being reduced to saying, well, which specialist are you seeing next in the hospital? And giving her a letter to bring in to the whatever specialist it was. And just thinking this is so inefficient. It's so bad for her. It's useless <laughs> for me. So I went back to my office in Trinity and I Googled or whatever it was back then, the idea of comorbidity or multiple conditions. And I came across the term multimorbidity and I know it's a terrible term. <laughs> and lots of people have said that over the years, but it is unfortunately what it's called in the research world. But it's essentially people who live with more than two uh, chronic conditions. And what, so I came across that there was just the beginnings of some research in that area. And what we know is that it has a very big impact on health outcomes for patients, but also on, on healthcare systems. It's very much associated with, um, with polypharmacy. Um, and you can see that's an image from a patient in one of our pilot studies who takes 15 regular medicines every day. It's just an extraordinary you know, burden to have to take all that. And the other image is, the, is represents this idea of treatment burden. And this is a concept that's kind of been around for the last 10 years, and it represents the work that we impose on patients to manage their conditions. 
And very often treatment burden is actually worse than their underlying disease burden. So we've reached a crazy situation in our healthcare systems that because we have single disease guidelines mm -hmm. and each single disease guideline has all these preventive drugs in them, that even somebody with something like common like diabetes and COPD or chronic obstructive lung disease can be on up to 13 medicines if you follow the guidelines regularly. Um, so we've had this explosion in polypharmacy as a result. So I think it's really critical that whenever we're introducing services or in doing interventions that we are aiming to reduce rather than increase treatment burden for patients. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about research that I've done since then, particularly in Ireland around multimorbidity. Um, and I'm going to call it multimorbidity and I'm very sorry if it's a horrible term, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, and the other thing I've always been really interested in is evidence synthesis and systematic reviews and the importance of building on existing knowledge instead of just presuming you're the first person to ever had an idea. That just doesn't <laughs> happen in the world. <laughs> um, and you should only work on what's already been done before. So systematic reviews. So we did a series of them over the years in Cochrane and then in other, uh, in other formats around multimorbidity. Now, multimorbidity is a kind of one of these things where people say to you, oh, you'll never find any interventions for that that work. It's too messy. The patients are all too different to each other um, and it's just impossible. But actually, and then there's, I, I mean, I've sat at meetings where somebody will sit up and very knowledgeably say, there's absolutely no evidence about multimorbidity, which is a bugbear of mine when people talk about there being no evidence about something. Mm -hmm. I think you need to have done a, re a review of the literature before you say something so confidently. But anyway, there is evidence about multimorbidity. There's 16 trials published with nearly 5,000 participants. It's just that there's no clear message coming from this body of evidence as to what might be the most effective intervention. And it's unlikely that there's going to be one magic bullet for something as complex and messy as multimorbidity. But what, what the existing evidence tells us is that things like care coordination may improve the patient experience of care, which is a really important outcome that is generally not valued in our metrics of, of research, but it should be. I mean, what's the purpose of a healthcare system if it isn't for patients to have a good experience of care? Um, and then the other the other suggestion is that self-management support may improve patient health behaviors, but you need much longer time frames than the existing trials to show that. So things like exercise, which I'll come back to. So Deirdre is here somewhere, Professor Deirdre Connolly. We've worked for uh, uh, several years. If you have, for a multimorbidity intervention to work, you have to have an intervention that is not disease oriented or disease focused so that it works across all conditions. So we were aware that cardiac and pulmonary rehab uh, programs, or six week programs that you do, have a very strong evidence base. They're, they're very cost effective. So occupational therapists are another generalist discipline like GPs. And so we decided that an OT led self-management support program would be a good thing for multimorbidity. So we've done a series of feasibility and pilot studies and then a small randomized trial which didn't show an effect on primary outcomes, but what it did suggest was that middle-aged people with more conditions are more likely to benefit from this type of an intervention. And that's an important uh, thing to build on. Then we got funding for the, from the HRB for the Primary Care Clinical Trials Network in Ireland. And one of the early funded trials in, for this network was a, a trial called SPIRE. It was building on the work of the PhD work of Barbara Klein, who's somewhere around <laughs> uh, and yeah there you are <laughs> and uh, other colleagues from RCSI like Frank who's also here beside Barbara <laughs> um, and Fiona Boland and others and it was led by a GP Caroline McCarthy and what what Spire was aiming to do was to try and target patients who were taking 15 or more regular medicines and you might think oh my god that's that's outrageous who's taking that many five percent of people over 65 in Ireland take 15 or more medicines every day and that's types of medicines, not tablets. <laughs> so you can imagine that it's just huge numbers. And um, we also had very strong interest from GPs for this trial because they really struggle to manage this, this patient group. And um, they're very complex. They're seeing multiple specialists. Everyone's changing their prescription the whole time. So we ran a, a web-based decision support uh, intervention for the GPs. And we did get a significant reduction in medicines. And um, now what it means for an individual patient is was statistically significant 
But the average number of medicines they were on was 17, and we reduced it to 15.5. And you might say, <laughs> so what? <laughs> but the important thing is that at a population level, that would make a really significant difference. But also in this patient population, even putting the brakes on escalating treatment is probably worth doing. And um, the other primary outcome was looking at a thing called potentially inappropriate prescribing, another horrible name for something, but essentially it reflects the safety and quality of prescribing. And it, we made no difference to that. But the reason for that was that the control GPs all improved as well as the intervention GPs. So this was happening in the background. The GPs were getting better and better at managing medicines which just shows you the importance of having, if we if we hadn't had a control arm, we'd have thought, oh, those GPs are really brilliant. Um, but but that, that was why we didn't show an effect. The other thing that's really important, so the aim is the thing called de-prescribing. You're trying to reduce and stop medicines. And people, particularly GPs, can be very worried about doing that, that they will cause potential harm and they can kind of back off from stopping a medicine that a specialist might have started. So we were also looking at the potential harms of de-prescribing. And the good news is that it appears to be a very safe thing to do, by and large. Of the 826 drugs that were stopped, there was only 15 adverse drug withdrawal events reported, and only one of them was a serious event. Now, interestingly, it, it's not what you might think. It's not one of the drugs that you'd normally associate with people being admitted to hospital, but it was stopping an antidepressant in somebody who was well, but had been on the antidepressant for years, and they ended up being readmitted to psychiatric hospitals. So it was a very serious with drug withdrawal event. And it just highlights that you definitely need to monitor people when you're doing this, but that it is by and large something that's safe to do. So the next piece of research is we got funding for a PhD program in multimorbidity. And we believe this was the world's first. It's only a little small baby PhD program with four PhDs in it. But you can see them there at the top. That's We had a meeting in November um, their final dissemination meeting. And that's with two of the patient experts who've supported their PhDs. And then the picture on the bottom is the, I think there was 14 multimorbidity PhD students came over from Scotland. So it's typical, they took our idea, they got millions and millions from the Wellcome Trust and they're going to have 40 PhDs in multimorbidity. <laughs> but they did credit us with thinking of the idea for them. Um, and then the other thing that was interesting that day, so it was very good that the, all the PhD students got together, but that, the, the Scottish PhDs were in Dublin the night of November, what was it, the 23rd? Mm -hmm. And balaclava clad men running past the window of their restaurant and stuff. So it was, and we were all, we were all, so it was, a, it was actually, it was quite an interesting, I'm going to come back to this idea of the context in which we're all doing our research, but they, they didn't see Dublin at its best, that's for sure. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the research that those PhD students have done that I've been uh, involved in supervising. And the first, Ashling, uh, uh, was supervised by Barbara, was her lead supervisor. And she looked at general practice-based pharmacists, building on work that we'd done with Michael Barry in the Medicines Management Program. And this work is nearly finished. The key message from this trial is that, of course, it's a good idea to put pharmacists into general practice. But it's not role substitution, which is often what the Department of Health like to think of it as. We don't really need GPs. We'll just have pharmacists instead. <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of often the message that goes out there. But the really critical thing is that it depends a lot on the type of practice you put the pharmacist into. So if you place a pharmacist in a well-organized, well-run practice, um, they really add value and they can work very closely together. But we had one practice that was in a really disadvantaged area. Uh, serve, you know, with a hospital that was also not any of the Trinity hospitals, a hospital <laughs> that was also really, really struggling with its demographics surrounding it. And actually all like the GPs were so overwhelmed by what was going on around them that when the pharmacist pitched up and say, hey, look, there's 10 more drugs that you can change them. They just couldn't cope with it. And it's very there was a huge trial in the US um, that Atul Gawande writes about a lot called the guided care program, looking at providing additional pods of care for elderly people with high healthcare utilization and with multimorbidity. And it only worked in one of the healthcare systems in the US and in the others it didn't work. Just highlighting that the system has to be ready for the intervention for it to work. And sometimes we just think, oh, this will be a really good idea and we just put it somewhere and it has no hope of working. Um, and it's just, that's one of the things that we've learned from this trial. The next one was a GP, a PhD student, Bridget Kiley, was looking at social prescribing, a very buzz topic area. 
And she started best practice. She started off by doing a systematic review of all the evidence of link workers providing social prescribing. And despite the millions and millions of pounds, particularly in the UK, that have gone into social prescribing, there's actually very limited evidence of its effectiveness or cost effectiveness. There's only eight trials with 6,000 participants, mm -hmm. and none of them were showed much effect. There's a suggestion that if you deliver it over longer periods of time for people and integrate it with the rest of their, their care, that it might be effective. Bridget was going on maternity leave just as this systematic review was published, and there was a huge, like her stress levels were high enough, but then the Times newspaper published this headline, which is that <laughs> prescribing art and gardening for patients may be a waste of money. And what was most interesting was that the social prescribing community went ballistic, but they didn't turn on the Times, they turned on us. <laughs> And they said that review is rubbish. You should never have done that research. It's just, you know, it's a waste of time. You didn't ask the right questions and all. So they really were kind of giving, it was our fault that, you know, that, that social prescribing is getting negative publicity. So we wrote a piece in the conversation kind of to address the balance and say, actually, our review just pointed out that, you know, there's not very much evidence that if you're going to put millions into something, you should have robust evaluations of it because there's always an opportunity cost. But then even the, the, the picture that the conversation ran with it is kind of trivial or this very happy woman doing her flower arranging. Mm -hmm. It's kind of not really taking the, the topic seriously. And then my family will know that I have been an absolute lifelong uh, fan of The Guardian. They're always slagging me off for saying what's on in The Guardian. But I got invited to do the Guardian Science Weekly podcast, which was a high. <laughs> and we had a very good discussion about the review and what it meant. And then even then they put this picture of two men surfing, which, you know, which social prescribing is probably very good for young people with mental health problems. And surfing is probably very good for them. But it wasn't what our research was about. <laughs> And then Bridget went on to do a trial uh, of providing link workers in very disadvantaged practices to, to deliver social prescribing. And we had additional funding from the Slauncher Care Integration Fund. And we began just as COVID arrived. So it was very challenging to run it. But what we did, it was probably useful because those practices at least had somebody who could do remote telephone support for people and could meet them and go for walks with them outdoors and all that kind of stuff. But we never, we couldn't recruit the number of patients we needed. But what we do know is that it, it was definitely very feasible to do it. It was very good uptake and referral to resources. Um, and that our economic evaluation suggested that if they had been working at full capacity, there would have been an 80% chance of cost effectiveness. So then the last PhD on this program that I supervised was James Larkin. And his question came directly from, um, we had patient and public involvement when we put the grant in in the first place. And a woman said to us, do you know what, even though my mother has a medical card, every time she has a hospital appointment, I have to take a half day off work or pay for a taxi for her to go. So this whole PhD was based on that one statement, <laughs> which is what is the financial burden for people living with multimorbidity? So James, with Barbara, support did a, a review of the qualitative literature on, fin on financial burden throughout the world. And it's really a big issue in countries that don't have universal access. But even in Ireland, this is data from the TILDA uh, cohort study, that people who have three or more conditions spend more than double their equivalized household income on their out-of-pocket expenditure on managing their health. So even if you have full access to free health care, it's, it's all the trips, it's all the way healthcare is organized that will end up giving you financial burden. I have to mention exercise. I see Noel McCaffrey over there. <laughs> So I exercise is clearly a very promising intervention for multimorbidity because we know the impact it has on physical and mental health. And I had done a systematic review with a Danish group called Mobilize showing that it's effective and safe for in multimorbidity. And then since coming to Trinity, um, Noel McCarthy had set up with Noel McCaffrey an evaluation of the of the Xwell program. I, I, I don't know if anyone from CHO7 is here, but they had the foresight to fund um XWELL for free for two years for anyone in the Tala, Clondalkin and NACE catchment area and a healthcare <clears throat> professional refers them and they can have 12 weeks of free XWELL. Um, so we have a, a, a trial or a study that's being led by Mwiran O'Shea, one of the GPs here in the department, I think was here somewhere, and we have 1300 participants in it. And we're looking at, there she is there at the back, <laughs> looking at impact uptake and retention. And Noel is just a force of nature. I'm sure many of you know him already but it's a really promising program and intervention for people who are living with, with uh, ongoing conditions. 
So this is the last of this series of research. This is what we just so this is what we've got funded more recently, and we're about to start this. And I can see Paul is just is coming over from Oxford to join us is here. And um, so this is a trial that we're going to do where we're building on the previous research. One arm of practice, one arm of the trial, they'll get a general practice based pharmacist. Another arm will get link workers delivering social prescribing. And then we have a, a third usual care arm. Um, you might well say to yourself after hearing all of these trials and studies, like you, you've all this stuff you're doing, very small effect sizes all the time. What's the point? <laughs> well, <laughs> what I would argue very strongly, apart from the fact that we need to have evidence to inform our decision making and decide on what interventions we're going to deliver. I mentioned earlier that we always do qualitative work with the people involved in the in the trials and the, the GPs who are involved in the SPIRE study with the people on the 15 or more medicines said to us, well, I only had 10 or 15 patients in your trial, but what I learned doing it, I have applied with all of my other patients. And we know that from all the, the cancer trials in hospital settings, that being in a trial is better for a patient, for their health, and being involved in research is better for practitioners. And it's, of course, better for the research because it will make it much more meaningful. So I would argue that even if we do get negative results, it's the ripple effect of it that's really positive. So I'm going to switch now to considering the context in which we uh, do our research and, of course, deliver our teaching and do our clinical practice. And this is me working very hard <laughs> at a research, a primary care research meeting in Canada. I was lucky to be able to go and see this exhibition by a Japanese artist called Yasoi Kusama, who normally does repeated image of pumpkins for any of you who kind of know about art. But she, um, she had this incredible installation of these shiny silver spheres that were on the floor, they were hanging off the ceiling and all mirrors all around them and everything bouncing back off each other. It was just a beautiful image, but it just highlights the messiness of the real world and the interconnectedness of everything. So you can't really consider health research and health outcomes without being aware of the determinants of health. And one of the really sobering things for healthcare professionals is that what we do only accounts for about 20% of health outcomes. Health behaviors account for about another 30%, and we may be able to have some impact on them through programs like Exwell. But 40% is down to socioeconomic factors and 10% is down to the, the physical environment. So no matter how many interventions we do and that we design and new systems we put in place, unless we address the full social determinants of health, we won't improve health outcomes. And that's because poverty is really bad for your health. And we all know this, but we don't really think about it beyond that. And we don't think of exactly the impact it has on individuals and on health systems. So in Ireland, there's a three to four year life difference, a difference in life expectancy between the richest and the poorest. But there's an 18 to 19 year difference in the years lived in poor health. And we know that people develop multimorbidity 11 years earlier if they live in the most disadvantaged communities compared to the most affluent, which means that a 60 year old in a disadvantaged community is the same as a 71 year old in an affluent area. So that has an enormous impact on our health systems and, of course, on our hospitals. <laughs> and I can see Lucy nodding. Yes. <laughs> so both of Trinity's main teaching hospitals serve very disadvantaged populations. And yet our system doesn't resource based on, on that particular need. Sometimes people think about health inequalities and they think of behaviors and there's a kind of a slight blame thing if only they'd stop smoking, if only they'd get up off the couch and do some exercise, everything would be fine. But actually when you say, well, they've also got double the rate of cancer mortality, then they kind of sit up and think, well, it's more, it's down to more than just their own behavior. And there's really interesting research coming out of Scotland, looking at a thing called missingness in the system. So these are the people that don't turn up for appointments. And, you know, often in, in when you're delivering healthcare, you think, oh, that's great. <laughs> I can catch up. It's not so bad, you know. But actually, we now know that people missing appointments is a real marker for actually they have a much higher rate of dying in the following year and they have much poorer health outcomes. And for children, it is nearly inexcusable that we do nothing about it. They have no agency about whether they turn up at an appointment, but yet DNA will be written in their chart. Their GP will get a letter saying they didn't turn up, so I'm taking them off the list. And it should be a red flag that actually we need to do more for those children than it, than it is. It also has an impact on the system. So in Dublin's north inner city, we have one GP for every two and a half thousand patients compared to the national average of one GP for every 1600 patients. 
And that's what's called the inverse care law. Again, many of you will have heard of this before, but it was a, a phrase coined by a GP in the South Wales Valleys more than 50 years ago. And he talked about the availability of good medical care tending to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. He also said, because he was a real socialist, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, he also said that this operates more completely where medical care is most exposed to market forces and less so where such exposure is reduced. So that brings me on to the deep end. Um, so the deep end is a movement that was formed in Glasgow about 15 years ago by Professor Graham Watt and other people. And essentially they decided to work out who were the hundred practices serving the most disadvantaged communities in Scotland. And they were able to do that. And they, 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 the idea is that these practices at the very deep end are like at the, literally at the bottom end of a swimming pool, they're drowning, they can't get their feet on that. Like it's not necessarily easy in the shallow end, but at least you can touch the bottom of the swimming pool. Um, and that's where the idea came from. And there's now about 12 deep end groups across the world. And we've had one in Ireland for about 10 years. And we focus on trying to advocate for resources based on need and infrastructure development in disadvantaged communities. And that's an image of some of us speaking to the Oireachtas Committee on the Future of Healthcare that led to the Sláinte Care uh, report. So this is an image. So over the years, we've it's one of the privileges of being a doctor is that politicians and civil servants and people in the HSC will often meet you if you ask to meet them. They might respond to about one in every four emails, but you can keep asking. So every time we go in to meet them, uh, Adele McGinnity did up this uh, image for them to really get the inverse care law rammed home. If you've got one doctor for three people in an average area and you've got one for six in a disadvantaged area, that's what the inverse care law is. And the people in the red side are sicker. <laughs> so you can't, you know, you just can't manage without. And it's not just doctors. It's the same for public health nurses, physios, whatever. And it's going to be the same in, in specialty care as well. So what we've learned about advocacy over the last number of years is it, the importance of data. People really like data when you go in to talk to them about problems. So we tell them what I've already told you about multimorbidity developing 10 years earlier, later cancer presentations and higher mortality. And if you can see that map, that's called a Pubble map, and that's a map of Dublin. And really all you need to know is that blue and dark blue are the affluent areas. You can work it out pretty quickly when you look at the map. <laughs> and orange kind of and dark orange are the disadvantaged areas. And up in the northwest of Dublin in Mulhuddert, the cancer mortality is 381 per 100,000. And five to six kilometers away in Castlenock, it's 128 per 100,000. So it's double in Mulhuddert compared to Castlenock. And that's the worst. Mulhuddert has the highest cancer mortality in the country. So but it's really a stark difference. Now, if sometimes what we notice is people don't necessarily care that much about things like this, <laughs> uh, but then when you mention to them the impact it has on emergency admissions and trolleys, they suddenly sit up <laughs> and they're very interested. So we know that the people who have the highest num number of conditions, which is associated with, with poverty and, and so socioeconomic disadvantage, account for 34% of emergency admissions to hospital and 47% of preventable admissions. So we, we know that and therefore we could try and do something about it. But as well as data, we have found that stories really, really matter. And again, this is one from Adele McGinnity, who is the GP in Mulhuddard. And she talks about this 53-year-old woman who she's seeing, it's obviously anonymized and made up name, who's got chronic lung disease, diabetes, depression, and severe eczema. Her 14-year-old son is about to be expelled from school. She's still smoking. Her diabetes is all over the place because she hasn't been able to eat a regular diet. She's got a chest infection, a flare up of her eczema. And at the end of a consultation that has almost certainly run very late, they both realize, oh, God, her cervical screening check is out, is up. And neither of them have the energy to do it. And that then links back to why you get later cancer. So unless you put more resource in for somebody like her to get her cervical screening, she's just not going to get it on time. It's not just, and don't you don't need to read this before you panic. <laughs> it's not just in general practice. This is data published last year from NHS England on integrated care service areas. The dark red are the, the, the population who are living in the most deprived areas, and the dark blue are the most affluent. And at the top is NHS Birmingham and Solihull, where there's more than 50% of the population are from the disadvantaged communities. And at the bottom is NHS Surrey and Heartlands, where it's actually exactly the opposite, more than 50% in the most affluent. 
But if you put the same resource into those two areas, which is what we very often do, and you expect the same outputs, mm -hmm. you're just crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, that you need to recognize the need, mm -hmm. uh, the difference in need between those two areas. I said I wanted to come back to privatization and corporate investment in health mm -hmm. just very briefly, because it is in Ireland, we've been aware of this in, in the hospital sector for a long time, but there is an evolving issue in primary care that's happening at the moment. And we just need to have our eyes open and be aware of what's happening and make an active decision about it. But there was a really good review of, of corporate investment in primary care in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. And there's definite potential benefits. There might be, you know, newer models of care benefits for physicians and that you can take administration and management away um, an opportunity for capital investment. And there are not for profit models, you know, where, you know, it, it isn't necessarily seeking to make money out of it. But there are real risks around equity and access and the impact on the publicly funded services, because the private services will undoubtedly cherry pick stuff that they can make more money out of easily and leave more complex patients in the public system. And um, the model, of course, as with all the capitalist models, depends on endless growth and consolidation. So it's not sustainable. Um, and then really interestingly, and this applies in Ireland with the, with the private um, sector, there's no way of getting any data on activity. It's like a black hole of information. And they say it's just protected by business interests. So that, I mean, that you can't, you can't know whether there's any good quality care going on at all. And there's probably a lot of duplication and poor quality. But anyway, uh, now I want to just switch over to a consideration of our core purpose, because we are, of course, um, in a university and we are meant to be teaching people. <laughs> um, and for me, what that means is reflecting what do we want a Trinity Medical School graduate to look like? Um, if you look at reviews of medical school curricula over the last five years, is the big buzz thing now is this head, heads, hands and hearts. You know, it's, you know, the head for knowledge, the hands for skills and the heart for kind of values and attitudes. I just want to map it back to evidence-based medicine, <laughs> which is exactly the same. <laughs> and if you can do that, those three things well and integrate them well, you should be a really good doctor. And the really important thing is that when a patient leaves any of our con consultation rooms or, uh, or those of our graduates, is that they have felt that somebody has listened to them and that they have been offered an opportunity to make a shared decision about their own treatment. I think it's also really important that people are aware of the system that they're working in and they're aware of things like health inequalities. And I'm really delighted to say that in the module we teach on, we have a very strong focus on equity for our students. We also had, we had a great GP tutor meeting last September where we had a talk from a, a UK GP on flourishing and the importance of the arts and humanities to sustain us through long, uh, stressful careers and one of the things I love about our module and I take absolutely no credit for it because it was up and running long before I got here Derek and Tom started this was our students take a picture on their smartphone whenever they go out to practice it's one of their assignments and they come back in and they give a little talk about what they've seen and you can see pictures all over the wall of, of that they've taken but I particularly like this one because to me it is the the essence of general practice is you have just don't know when the students come out to us You've no idea what's coming through the door. It could be a baby, it could be maternal health, it could be an old person, like, and they can't, they, they sometimes come to general practice thinking, oh, it's all coughs and colds, and very quickly they get disabused of that idea <laughs> when they see the variety and the complexity of what's going on. But even if you're in a super specialist, maybe a cleft lip and palate clinic, <laughs> actually, the people coming through the door will be really different. Um, you know, so it, it, it's, it's important uh, that you're always ready whoever's coming in. I want to just spend a couple of minutes thinking about, I think we've all noticed how young people um, our, our current students and our graduates are really often struggling with the effect of having lived through COVID, but also the pressure of the anxiety around climate change and migration. Um, this is a brilliant book, which is actually written about migration. And it points out that we are in fact a migratory species. We're supposed to migrate. And actually Irish people have always been migrating all the time, uh, but we just get into a panic when it's somebody else doing it. <laughs> um, and that, that we need, we actually need migration um, because of the changing societal structures. But, and if we plan it properly, it'll be a really, really good thing. But if we resist planning it, it will be chaos and disaster. So there is an opportunity for us to, to do something positive. 
I'm a huge fan of Naomi Klein. <laughs> and one of the other big changes in my adult life has just been obviously the use of smartphones um, mm -hmm. and this digital life that everybody is leading, the mirror world it creates, everybody in their own silo, the polarization. Mm -hmm. And that has also applies across generations. You know, you know, the idea that us boomers have wrecked the world, taken all the money, which we probably have. <laughs> but then the kind of criticism of, you, oh, you know, the younger, flakier generations, if only they worked as hard as we worked. I mean, it's crazy that we're setting each other up like this. Um, and Naomi Klein, I, I heard her speak in September in the RDS about her new book, which is really worth reading. And somebody my age, a boomer said to her, like, you know, how come young people aren't doing anything? Their, their heads are stuck in their phones and they're not doing anything about climate change. And she just said, it's actually not their responsibility to do it. It's all of our, you can't just signal out other people to change things. It's, it's everybody's responsibility. And then many of you will have read this book that was just um, won the Booker Prize, this Irish novel uh, last year. And it is a very scary, thought it's about you know Ireland descending into a totalitarian state and having been in Dublin on that night last in Thursday in November just get a little hint of it with helicopters swirling around up up ahead but there's a brilliant line in that which at the very end which is that the war the world is always ending somewhere and we're lucky it's not actually ending here at the moment but it could <laughs> and if we don't try and protect our liberal democracies you know that's where we could be headed um but I don't want to just end on a really negative note. <laughs> so um, it, when I, I was thinking reasons to be cheerful, and you probably all think of the song, and my family, again, will completely slag me off for never remembering who sung what song or what it was actually called. <laughs> so I thought this was a talking head song, but of course it isn't. I'm sure many of you will tell me it's actually Ian Jury and the Blockheads. But by complete coincidence, when I looked it up, David Byrne of Talking Heads has set up a website called Reasons to be Cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> and he's done it to counteract the negative media that we're surrounded all the time by negative news. And this website is really worth looking at if you're feeling a bit fed up <laughs> because it just gives lots of positive news stories. The other thing that I'm nearly finished listening to, and it's I really highly recommend it. This is a book by a young Scottish uh, woman called Hannah Ritchie. She's the medical researcher for the website Our World in Numbers that many of you may be familiar with that Hans Rosling set up. Mm -hmm. And essentially she has taken data and she's examining a lot of the very, very alarmist myths around climate change and soil degradation and you name it, she, she's, she's looking at it. And she just puts everything into context, but she identifies things that can be done that will actually be really effective. And it's a good way of calming your nerves if you're feeling anxious about the future. The other thing that, of course, I will say about reasons to be cheerful is general practice, huge potential if it's resourced properly, the potential and continuity of care for relationships, continuity of information. We know that continuity improves health outcomes. And we, in general practice, we have the capacity to target and address individual need and to treat people holistically. We can apply evidence-based care and get involved in research and advocacy, and that will uh, influence policy choices. This is actually my favorite Julian Tudor Hart quote. So he's apart from coining the inverse care law, he actually <laughs> spent his whole career in this Welsh mining uh, valley measuring everybody's blood pressure. He was really he was the first person to really do that meticulously. And what he said at the end of his career, because if you mm -hmm. control blood pressure, you reduce the subsequent risk of stroke, um, is that professionally the most satisfying and exciting things have been the events that have not happened. No strokes, no coronary heart attacks, no complications of diabetes, no kidney failure with dialysis or transplant. And this is the real stuff of primary medical care. So sometimes we just don't get to see the benefits of what we do well, but we should know that they are definitely there. So in my list of reasons to be cheerful, I've mentioned the potential of general practice. We've just had a confirmation of three years of funding from the Taoiseach's office and the Department of Health for Defend Ireland. I've seen through that fund uh, and also through work that Noel and Derek have been doing that was publicized a lot this week. If you saw about the Oliver Bond Street flats, mm -hmm. using GP data to highlight differences in asthma, depending on whether you are more likely to have mold in your houses. Um, now, the, so there's a huge increasing potential to use routine data to target resources. The image I've borrowed from Sarah Burke, <laughs> it's familiar. 
Sarah has reminded me several times over the years that things are much better than they used to be. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> In our health system. So Sarah is a health systems expert who provided advice along with Steve Thomas and others to the Slauncher Care uh, program. And even though Slauncher Care is slow, it's kind of chugging along very, very slowly, it's still there. And at its heart, it has universalism and it has resourcing based on need. So it still could work. <laughs> Now, what I also want to say is the real reasons to be cheerful are actually the people that, that we work with. My GP colleagues from Inchicore, family doctors, and um, my colleagues in Trinity, all around me, colleagues in Tala and Hikwa, people who are really actually dedicated to public service. And they do this because they believe in it and they are doing it because they want outcomes to be better for patients. And if you look around you, you'll see way more of those people than you'll see of negative people. So this is the last, this is a, a book that I heard about last summer. I was at a meeting in the UK and Andrea Williamson, who's an academic GP from the Deep End in Scotland, mentioned this book. And I just loved this idea of digging where we stand. And so you are where you are and you think about, well, what can I do where I am? And it's again, it's like the research, it's this incremental small steps of making things better. But what she asked us to do was to consider this yourself. Where do you stand? in your research context, in your teaching context, in your clinical practice, in your policy context, where should you dig? So if you only remember one thing from this talk, <laughs> remember, dig where you stand. And then I just want to finish by saying thank you to my core team, <laughs> many of whom are here, but James, who's online <laughs> from Oxford, and they have always been such a support and a pleasure to go home to and kept me nice and grounded. <laughs> and by complete coincidence, today, actually today, is my mother's 14th uh, anniversary. She was an extraordinary woman. She was a child psychiatrist who founded Trinity's Masters in Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy. It's quite a big mouthful, but she was very interested in early attachment and infant psychiatry. So I was incredibly lucky to have her as a mother. Amazing. You know, people say, oh, you did well because you worked hard. You do well because you were lucky when, in, in the cards you get in your life. Um, so. And I will also credit my father, <laughs> Charlie Smith, who is a forensic psychiatrist, who was the director of the Central Mental Hospital in Dundrum. Now, my sister Amelia is also here. We both have. This. So being the, ch the children of two psychiatrists has been quite interesting. <laughs> and it led one of the nuns in our convent school once to say, well, they are surprisingly normal. <laughs> it's a bit rude. <laughs> so this is my last slide. And this is I, I read this actually at my mother's funeral. And it's from my favorite book of all time, which is Middlemarch by George Eliot. But I really believe that there are so many Dorotheas all around us. So this is what uh, George Eliot said about Dorothea at the end of the book. The effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. So thank you very much. I think you can't ask questions, so talk. <laughs> Thank you. It's not that you can't ask questions, but I think, <laughs> I think, so I, I, think <laughs> I think Susan deserves a break after that. We didn't even give her a glass of water. And um, I, I think if you can forgive me, um, I, I think Susan has given us another reason to be cheerful, to be yeah. very, to be very honest with you. You know. <laughs> And though you may describe yourself as perfectly normal, I think you're more perfectly normal than a lot of people. <laughs> well, well done. I, I mean, for you know, for the the wisdom, humanity, the whole spectrum there, and I think we are very lucky to to have Susan here in in the department and in Trinity and in Tala, and you know, you you can only be hopeful to sit, to look at all the team around you and the work that you're doing. And I think we're all greatly appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. So thank you.
but it is customary to give her a break. Um, <laughs> but you can continue the conversation outside or 